Right, welcome everybody. Next episode of the Athletic Fitness and Nutrition Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Burgess, and we are here today speaking with a great guest. I'm not sure if I'm going to get her surname right, <laughs> but I'm going to try. It's Christina Vasilevia. Almost, almost. It's Vasilieva. <laughs> Vasilieva. My apologies. No, that's all right. And just for people who don't know you, let's just, I'm just going to try and give you kind of an introduction. Okay. See if I get you right. Okay, so former model. Yep. Into your photography. Yep. Big into e-commerce. Mm -hmm. um, interest in psychology, inspired by self-development, good energy and adventure, which is going to be interesting. <laughs> we'll talk about that soon. Thank you. <laughs> As far as I know, it's a future UK BFF competitor. Yep, fingers crossed. Yeah, looking for an IFBB Pro card at some point. Mm -hmm. And I've seen you train the, in, in the gym, so I'm going to give you the label of um, just an all-round badass. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very happy with that one. <laughs> and that's it. So if there's anything else that you think I've missed out, let me know. Um, yeah, that pretty much sums it up. Um, okay. yeah, by, well, career-wise, I'm a photographer and I work in e-commerce, uh, several different businesses that my brother owns online, so a uh, bit of a jack of all trades. I get involved in all sorts of different things as, you know, my passions and hobbies, they develop, and uh, next one is, hopefully, fingers crossed at some stage, we'll take that career path down, sort of health, fitness, sports, whether or not I'm a coach or a nutritionist, so... Okay. Essentially, someday that's, that's where I'd like to take it. Good. And tell us about where you started in your fitness and the journey because you've been doing it a while mm. and I know recently things have changed mm -hmm. your focus and the way you train and so on. But let's go back to the beginning because what we want at the end of this and what I'll try and do with all the podcasts is find at least one piece of information that people listening can immediately go and implement into their daily life today mm -hmm. and get some benefit from it because i listen to podcasts all the time i watch videos i do lots of research and i know you do too mm -hmm. and one of the things that really annoys me is that you you listen to something for an hour mm -hmm. and you go yeah that's great but how do i apply that to mm -hmm. life today mm -hmm. so let's find out about where you came from and then let's see what tips you've got and uh just go from there okay well Taking it right back to the beginning, I was always a very sporty, athletic child. I was always very interested in fitness and health for as long as I could remember. And uh, my life has taken me through a whole roller coaster of different events. And uh, around the age of um, probably, I'd say, about 18, 18, 19, I unfortunately descended into a whirlwind of eating disorders and I had anorexia which developed further down the line into bulimia for a few years I think it was about four three or four years um, which in the grand scheme of things isn't very long I mean some people suffer for a hell of a lot longer than I did but very luckily um, even with what experience I had as a child I was always competing in all the um, all the different sports competing for the borough in athletics and everything that I'd learned and felt so passionate about for some reason just they went out the window it's uh, okay. it's a funny thing how that happens I mean the brain is just it's a mystery how it works and how things can take you the way that they do and personally I believe everything does happen for a reason and I never have regrets everything that we do makes us who we are and all the mistakes that we might make they teach us the <laughs> the life lessons that we need to learn. So up until um, I was possibly about 22, 23 when I started to um, realize that I needed to make a change. So I knew exactly what I had to do. I knew everything that I needed in terms of my psychology, my physiology, the imbalances that I had, the hormonal issues that I was going through and the deficiencies that needed correcting and addressing so the first thing that I did was I got up and I decided I need to start going back to the gym. Um, I trained from, from about the age of 16 anyway. I had my first ever gym membership, I think, when I was about 15, 16, you know, just doing the odd, the odd class here and there and the yeah. treadmill bunny. And so I knew basically that was my knowledge of going to the gym. And I knew I had to get some endorphins. I knew I had to get get my health and my fitness, my cardio back to back on point, back on track. So 
I decided from that moment when I woke up and I, I said, this is it, I'm going to change, I'm going to try and change my life for the better and sort myself out and implement all the knowledge that I knew that had, uh, that were the most important factors. Okay, so before, so, before you go further yeah. on, Christina, what was it that made that change in you? What, what, what happened that made you get up that morning and say, right, that's it, I'm going to change now? Uh, because four years yeah. of, you know, struggling with, uh, food and thoughts about food and, mm. and the whole attitude towards it, oftentimes there needs to be some sort of catalyst that makes that change. What was it for you? Well, um, where do I begin? <laughs> so, oh, really? the health issues and uh, how you deteriorate really takes its toll. And I think I reached breaking point. Um, gosh, the things that I would went through, it took, obviously it took so many years to actually get to this stage but things start to take their toll on your body and what you don't realize is that the things that happen over time inside that you can't see I'm talking your psychology, your mood, um, your hormone imbalances, all the deficiencies they don't really start to surface until a certain stage, but at that stage, when you actually start to see them physically and tangibly, they've got to that level where it's 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 really quite severe, if that makes sense. Yeah. So the things that started to develop, um, skin problems, my hair, I lost a lot of hair, my hair fell out a hell of a lot. Um, water retention was horrific. Um, there were times when my legs were, my ankles were twice the size, I couldn't fit my feet in my shoes and I had insomnia, I was not sleeping for days on end um, and at this wow. stage I had already um, gone through anorexia to the other end where I was starting to descend into bulimia and it started to take its toll on my, my throat. All your glands swell up, um, yeah. you get huge cheek, your face is twice the size because all of that bacteria that all of the bile and everything that you're throwing up and it starts to really it, it's, it's just awful and it, it's visible and people who sort of know a little bit about it they'll be able to recognize it pretty much straight away um, teeth obviously yeah. Um, actually, I, went, I had a, an awful experience where I had to have a root canal, which aside from all the pain and the agony you go through, it's, uh, it's a bit of a hit on, on the wallet. <laughs> so yeah, absolutely. I spent a hell of a lot of uh, money trying to sort out my teeth. Um, yeah, and aside from that, just your mood, your depressed, depression, oh gosh, you know, you just don't want to do anything. Yeah. Um, your whole life revolves around food, but food is obviously it's just a byproduct of. I mean, your your fat loss is a byproduct of the anorexia. I mean, it's just all about control and it's the psychology mm. of it. So, um, yeah, my whole life practically revolved around food and planning and uh, nothing else really. Everything else took a, you know, the back burner, and that's it. And so, first of all, thank you for being so open and honest and talking about it. Um, a lot of people don't like talking about mm. it. But um, do you feel, though, you just came to a point where everything had accumulated to a place where you were just so not feeling happy and so many things in life were so difficult mm. and the side effects now were becoming so unpleasant mm. that you just decided, you know what, I don't want to live like this anymore. Was it was it as simple as that, or it's, was there anything it else? It does pretty much sum it up, and it's really weird because to think that I mean, some people they're not fortunate enough to have a whole um, a whole army of, of friends and and loving family and people that care about them who to support them throughout these things. And despite yeah. this, even though I have everything, I had everyone behind me. I had people who were willing to to do anything to help my situation and. It's it's a really confusing thing how nothing and nobody and no intervention could possibly change your mind until you reach that stage where it's your choice. Yeah. And 
I think it did just reach that stage where people had spent so much time and you can see people around you falling apart, you know, people in distress, you're causing this issue. Mm. But then to see yourself and you have those moments and I'm sure everyone has them in life where you, you have an out of body experience where you look at yourself and you look at the bigger picture and you try and see a different perspective and there were a couple of times where I was in hospital and <laughs> And you just take a moment and look at yourself and you think, this is, this is life and this is not how I should be yeah. spending mine. And if I want to continue and actually have a life, then I'm going to have to make a change and it's going to have to be my choice and I'm going to have to try and... I think that's a really, really interesting point because I know for a fact in my life, I've definitely had a few times where I've stepped back and said, hang on a minute that's not the person I want to be mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that's not where I saw myself or that's not that doesn't sit comfortable with me as as far as my journey is concerned mm -hmm. and you do you kind of step out of it and you go almost reset get a new perspective mm -hmm. okay let's go and change things and go again yeah and it's, it's it's true I mean a lot of people do definitely go through it I think it's really important to be able to do that. I mean, it's the same thing. and You can apply that to anything in life. If you're not happy what you're doing, where you are, how things are working out for you, the only thing that can change that is you and your proactivity. So, Absolutely. <laughs> well, I guess that's a different conversation altogether. But the fact that yeah. I had to do something about it, and I think, I think it's just that moment of clarity where I was thinking, well, you know what? I'm smarter than this and it's funny because despite what you know and I knew exactly how I was breaking my body down I knew the the um, the consequences I, I knew exactly what was going to happen the brain how it works I was reading into the psychology of things and despite knowing exactly what you're going through and it's not like I was in denial but I was quite sort of I don't know, I used to embrace everything that was happening to me and just, it was that control of knowing yeah. everything. And despite knowing this, you just let it happen until you reach a stage where you want to try and apply your knowledge in a different way. <laughs> yeah. So it's almost like a challenge in itself, I guess. Absolutely. But also there's a frustrating point where you go, I know all of this. Mm. I know how to not do this. I know why I shouldn't be doing mm -hmm. it. It all makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. It's all logical. Right. Why am I behaving in a different way? And I think then people realize that you can be as logical and as educated as you like, mm -hmm. but when you're dealing with an emotional issue, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter mm -hmm. because you can't make a logical decision based on an emotional situation. Mm -hmm. it, they, they just don't work together. So we got to a point where enough was enough you decide right gym membership here we come treadmill bunny yeah. <laughs> classes whoop, whoop. yeah body Boom. pump <laughs> that's it body pump bring that oh i used so to food. uh yeah i used to love the circuits food came back in yes so i needed to balance everything out so essentially i started to try and Back then I didn't know the technical word for reverse dieting but essentially I knew that was the process that needed to happen so I started bringing in food, um, supplementing, getting everything back to a nice equilibrium. Um, I put on a, not a lot of weight, I wasn't overweight but I managed to get a really decent foundation back onto me, I, you know, a little bit of mass. Started, well, continued with a nice, consistent daily gym training. I, I think I was doing mainly circuits. And then... What uh, what weight did you go down to? Uh, 46. 46 kilos. 46 kilos. Yeah. Wow. And... Uh, For someone who's, what, 5'8"? Five 5'8", five five eight, eight, yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's really slim. I can overhead press that now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, and I think my weight crept back up to sort of around 60K, where I was nice, sort of happy medium, you know, a bit of extra extra fat on me, but yeah. I wasn't muscular or anything. In fact, I'd suffered so much muscular atrophy that it was a really difficult way to put weight back on because 
you have to witness that skinny fat look but I was used when I was back sort of when I was 16 and 17 when I was a much younger athlete, athletic person I was always I always had a really decent foundation of mass on me I was just born like that I always had a bit of bit of a muscular look to myself and um, it was very difficult coming out the other end of that and I'd completely lost yeah. a lot more than I should have you know and it's just it's a lot more difficult to try and put that back on and I felt and also, like I'd psychologically take 10, 10 steps back okay psychologically it's quite upsetting as well to know you know I was better than this and now I'm trying to put it on and that 10 steps back is a is a long way that's a long 10 steps you know I, so I have to be completely honest there were there were times I had I think I had two or three lapses yeah. Within the first, say, year, I'd say within the first year of myself making that decision to change. But in the grand scheme of things, that's not a huge, I mean, it's not a huge det detriment because two or three lapses, I mean, everyone, t most people, shall I say, who go through it tend to have relapses. Yeah. And the most important thing is that you get out of them, of course. That's it. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, at the time when that relapse occurs, it can be almost slow soul destroying in the fact that you think oh i don't want to be back here again yeah but if you've got that attitude of right well this is temporary and now i'm going to get back out of it again mm. that's a that's a strong place to come from i think after each relapse it made me a hell of a lot stronger because it made me realize yeah. oh my gosh why did i do that again why did i do that again? Yeah. but it does make you think no no not for me not anymore yeah. done done right. invested um yeah so so then you got back into shape, you started eating a bit more, you weren't happy with your body composition. Yep. yep. And then is that kind of a realization then that Les Mill classes and <laughs> running on a treadmill weren't really getting you where you were? Oh, to it's go? hilarious. That's exactly what happened. It's funny because I didn't know a hell of a lot of training. But back then, I used to think that I knew a hell of a lot about training. I think, yeah, I'm doing circuits, I'm really fit, I'm super fit, I can do this, I can do that. I had, I've always, well, I had a pull-up bar for so many years, and I would always use pull-up bars, so I'd be doing my pull-ups, my push-ups, um, chin-ups, I'd do everything, body weight I was a big fan of. And so... Can I just, can I just stop you there, Christina, yeah. and just for people listening uh, or viewing on YouTube, just so you guys know, I've seen Christina doing weighted wide grip pull-ups <laughs> not messing around doing underhand grip chin-ups proper man size wide grip pull-ups with i don't know 15 20 kilos <laughs> on a on a belt and 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 repping it out not just doing one or two but proper rep. <laughs> so so that that bar that you had at home certainly played a, a good role in getting your fitness i definitely there. think yeah but what i do think body weight exercises have their place in building that foundation and then yeah. as you say you reach a stage where you just think okay where do I go from here <laughs> yeah, so yeah. um there was a time I think it was two and a half years exactly that I realized after about a year of myself doing you know a treadmill and actually just getting myself back in the gym back in the routine doing the classes doing the circuits, that I reached that plateau where my body weight wasn't going to take me anywhere further. And I was, as you say, unhappy with my body composition. I thought, okay, how am I going to look like this woman and this woman, you know, in the, all the muscle right. mags thinking, but how did, I know how to train. Why am I not looking like this? And I thought, okay, I'm going to have to start lifting properly. I'm going to have to start learning how to train hardcore and I'm going to look for, an, <laughs> I remember, this was exactly my thought process at the time, I thought right I'm going to find myself a, a nice hardcore underground gritty spit and sawdust gym because that is what's going to take me where I want to go. So right. off I went on Google of course <laughs> and found my first gym which is just down the road, uh, it used to be called New Spartan Gym, I'm sure you know, yes. and uh, went down there and basically said look and they had the posters on the wall and I said, well, I want to look like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I explained my situation and where I was coming from and, you know, 
the foundation I needed to build. And the first thing that was suggested for me is to get on a nice, good, basic five by five rope program. So that's where I started lifting yeah. properly. <laughs> good. Okay. And then you kind of, in my, from what I know, found that you've got a pretty good talent for lifting some heavy bits of iron. You know, I've seen you do your chest press. I've seen you do your, like I said, your pull-ups and your deadlifts. And and you train with some pretty strong guys. Um, and they often have trouble keeping up. <laughs> you know, it's not it's, it's, it's not an exaggeration when, you know, when you're hitting like a, a 100 kilo uh, chest press and um, I'm not sure what you deadlift, but it's, it's, it's high. Yeah. So you then spent a few years doing power training? Yeah, well, the funny thing is, I know that everyone has their thing, whether or not they really enjoy strength, whether they really enjoy MMA or bodybuilding and getting that pump. I always really enjoyed that strength. I always, well, actually, having said that, I was going in with a clear cut goal for myself as well. I wanted to be strong and healthy. At that time, I was still just bringing my health back up to par. Um, I needed to build my muscle, my strength. I was, I was, I'd put on weight, but I was weak. I felt weak. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to shape up, obviously. So I was really enjoying the strength training and the, the gains that I was getting from it, the numbers that I was hitting, it was spurring me on. I really enjoyed the five by five, but I also really understand the value and the importance that doing compound lifts, body weight yeah. lifts. Um, so what's, let's go through some numbers really quickly. Mm -hmm. You bench, squat, deadlift. Um, bench, 80K, I'm working towards the 90 now, but that's with okay. a spot. I can easily yep. rep out 70K, which is a nice, comfortable medium for me at the moment. Um, yep. So pull-ups, I'm on 10K for six, seven reps at the moment. I usually right. do about five, six sets if I'm doing lower reps. Um, deadlift, my personal best was 132.5. <laughs> nice. That extra 0.5 counts. Yeah, um, uh, what else? Uh, squat, 90K, I need that 100K. Okay. 100K. But I have to say, ATG, always full, full range. <laughs> yeah, no quarter yeah. reps. Good. Okay, so... Um, heavy lifting, short reps, strength comes on, start getting some good shape to yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and for your frame, obviously, it looks good because it's all in proportion. Um, and then what happened? What was the next stage? So I did a good basic strength protocol for about the two years. It's been about two and a half years now, and I think I started to properly balance things out with more volume over the past sort of four or five months I would say so I think over those two years and I think it's really important you build that basic strong foundation and you get to a stage where things that are things that are imbalances um, maybe asymmetry weaknesses they will start to be more apparent and yeah. I think that's when it's really important to start addressing those things. So I might change things up and put more volume in here and, you know, just find things that need working on more than others. And that's what I've been doing over the past few months. So I've done a hell of a lot more volume, increased my reps. I've been, obviously my goals have changed as well. I'd like to put a bit, bit more size on. Um, and I decided obviously with a competition next year in April, I need to start shaping things up a little bit more yeah. um, some areas need more work than others so that's where I started to bring in different types of training approaches All right so this is an interesting point um, going back to your strength training mm -hmm. and and then saying then you wanted to put on some size mm -hmm. a lot of people will go into a, a, a gym and say right I want to get big mm -hmm. and I want to get strong but the two don't necessarily correlate with each other so I was in the gym the other day, mm -hmm. and I kid you not, there was a guy there who was doing one-arm dumbbell preacher curls mm -hmm. with 40-kilo dumbbell for reps, Whoa. properly. Whoa. No messing around. Mm -hmm. 
And I said to him, I said, you know, that's some weight you're moving there. That's immensely strong. Right. And he said, yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to go for 42 and a half kilo. And he gets a 42 and a half kilo dumbbell out and he reps that as well. But the point was, although he was massively strong, he wasn't necessarily the biggest guy in the place. Mm -hmm. And whilst he had reasonably shaped arms, you would not credit the strength with the size of his arm. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of people find that a misconception that they come in and go, right, we're going to do five by five, because you can find that on the internet anyway. Mm -hmm. Five by five, get your strength up, you'll get big, blah, blah, blah. And guys will go in there and hit that up for months on end. Mm -hmm become very strong but never get any of that growth involved and and people aren't aware that strength doesn't necessarily equal size mm. and when you're going for an aesthetic look especially if you're going to compete or do something like that or, or you just want it for your holiday whatever it is oftentimes you don't need to go that heavy mm. Mm. and you can still put size on yeah you're going to be a little bit less strong but at the end of the day it depends what that goal is yeah. So, so you moved into doing a little bit more hypertrophy training, a little bit more high rep, so on and so forth. Let's go back to your strength <laughs> training again. One, one tip that you can give people if they're going to go into that strength arena and they can implement that today, what would it be? What would be the one thing out of all the experience you had in that arena that you say that's the, more, that's the most important thing to do? So is their goal to get strong? Yeah, well, if, if they're going they want, to, okay. if they're doing that strength that's the, what's the big thing that's going to get them that strength? One fundamental aspect, and it's always this number one, progressive overload. If you want uh, to get yeah. stronger, you have to be adding weight to the bar. You have to be prepared to take yourself outside of your comfort zone. Um, that's just the one. I mean, I have obviously others, but... I definitely okay. say progressive overload. I see so many people who are just too afraid or it's all in their mind or they think they can't and they're not ready to take their their mindset to an, to the next level. There right. was a, I remember when I picked up a weight to do some single arm dumbbell rows and Paul, the other Paul who was at the gym who was introducing me to this, he said, yeah. pick up the 30K. I almost choked. And on my first day, I was doing single arm dumbbell rows on 30K. Although, of course, with a couple of cheat reps and this and that. But yeah. I'll tell you what, a week or two later, after doing that for, for I was doing three days a week, obviously, um, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And um, two, I think it was one or two weeks later, easily repping out 30K single arm dumbbell rows on my first first. Day, uh, first two weeks lifting and a lot of yeah. people don't realize that they can lift more than perhaps they might think that's not to say it's for everyone I mean I know there are people out there who will go and they'll you know they'll injure themselves but be wise but do use that progressive overload to your advantage so the other thing then I've just picked out of there is that the mindset is ultimately important oh yeah because the fact that you went in there and thought I can't lift that 30 and then did it immediately your mind then resets itself and says okay yep. that's that's okay for me now oh yeah now I'll go heavier yeah. it's interesting you say that i read an article today on the the use of steroids and why people use them mm -hmm. and experiments and research that was done within that group mm -hmm. and i'm not um massively educated on that subject it's not something that i get involved with and it's not something i uh advise my clients on but what was interesting to me is they took a group of uh, college kids mm -hmm. and told them that they were going to give them um, steroids. The Shiba effect. And they all improved their lifts over a six-week period mm -hmm. by about 20%. So they, then told, they then told half of them that you're going to continue on the steroids mm -hmm. And the other half, they said, in actual fact, we've just been giving you a placebo. Four weeks later, the group that were told they are continuing on their steroids had put another 5% on their lifts. The other group went back to where they first started and were unable to make any progress on their lifts. <laughs> so they lost all the gains. They lost all that power gain that they had. And they went back to beginning, even though 
they knew they were able to do the lifts because they'd done them on a placebo, so they knew they could do it naturally. Their mindset just did not allow it to happen. Wow. Massively interesting. Similar sort of thing where, uh, you know, people, people, I think they did experiments where the uh, the lifters didn't know what they were lifting or what weight was on the bar. And people right. can often lift a hell of a lot more than they think they can. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. yeah I say to clients, I tell clients all the time, why, why are you counting it? Because mm. you'll see people go up to a bar and go, oh, that's 20, 40, 60, mm. plus the bar. But why are you counting it? <laughs> Just lift it and then we'll worry about it yeah. afterwards. Yeah. And you are, you're right. People do make some big, big differences. So we've moved on to now your hypertrophy type of training at the moment. You're still using kind of overreaching techniques and yeah. and... Yeah. I'm training quite hard. So tell us a bit about that and what you've been going on, what's been going on. Ah, well, I have to say, I mean, it's just, it's one of those things I can't get away from. I absolutely love to lift heavy, whatever it is I'm doing. I'll always, what I've decided to implement now is basically to get the best of both worlds. I do a lot of pyramid sets where I'll be going up in weight gradually to maybe my two to five rep ranges and then coming back down in order to get that volume back in there. And I okay. won't do that for every single exercise, but I'll do that for some of my main, my favorite exercises, things like yeah. uh, I'll always pyramid my dips, always pyramid my dips, um, my pull-ups and chin-ups, things that are going to be all my compound exercises. I'll try and do heavier sets, but I feel like I'll need to do a little bit more volume. So on my way back down, I'll be going back into the eights and tens. And right. So... And what's the highest rep range you're going to at the moment? Um, uh, 20, but that's just on. I'm enjoying the 20 rep squats. Okay. Which I got from you. <laughs> yeah, yeah okay. that's, that's, um, that's actually quite nice. I'm enjoying that because it does push you. It's, it's, it's such, I mean, the high you get from doing that 20 rep set where you think you can't finish it. You yeah. power through it to the end because it's a squat as well. You just feel absolutely broken by the end of four sets. But also you feel getting through that 12, 15, 18 reps, different parts of your quads and hamstrings being engaged yep. that aren't necessarily needed further down the rep range. Mm -hmm. And, be, and you know, that's a very typical picking up type 1, type 2A, type 2B muscle fibers during different parts of the movement. And people don't realize that getting through those barriers and for some people you know when we do our dna testing and we find people have got a, a lot of endurance capacity mm -hmm. we'll put them into something doing 40 50 reps on a on a leg press or mm -hmm. something volume wise and they can manage it really easily because they've got the inherent uh, endurance gene that allows them to go right we can we can turn this uh, oxygen over very quickly, we can get energy from it, and we're not going to tire out. Whereas some other people have got, obviously, a, a higher power ratio, maybe can't go to the 50 or 60 rep range. But there's a there's a place for it for everybody. But I'm really glad that you're going on that higher rep because I think that will make a big difference to you as well. Yeah. It's just a it's just a range that you haven't explored before mm. so much. Yeah, I mean, I've heard of the the 50s and the hundreds as well, and I think it was Phil Lerney who recently posted up a, a post something about the. Oh yeah, he wrote this tiny little um, post about that mindset that you reach where it's a totally different experience when you get past that 30, 40 rep range and you're yeah. on the way to that 50 and you think you're going to die. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting, I mean, you get a hell of a lot of gain out of it. I think I've seen a lot of good changes just from upping my yeah. rep range and just from doing something different and pushing my boundaries that step further. Yeah, and it will stimulate your body in a way it's not used to. Mm. But I've done, um, well. yeah, I've done some um, high rep stuff in the past. I like to try everything just to see how it affects me. And then, you know, I can't tell a client, yeah, you should do that unless I've tried it because I don't know what the effects are. Mm. But DTP is a is a is a very mm. common mm. Um, protocol that's done that's used on bodybuilding.com. Chris Gethin wrote it, and so yeah. on. And the first day of that is leg press, yeah. leg press and calves. And the leg press starts at 50 reps, yeah. 40, 30, 20, 10, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. So there's a, a huge amount of rep range going on. I've been curious to try that DTP. <laughs> um, 
after the first set, I, from my experience, first set, first day when you've never done it before, you feel sick. Mm. Just that first 50 reps. And you do think to yourself, like you said, what am I doing mm. and how am I ever going to get through this? Here's one thing for listeners, if, if they really want to try this high rep stuff, for whatever reason, psychologically wise, if you count down the reps, mm -hmm. it ends up being a lot easier somehow than if you count up the reps. That's interesting because I, I do that quite often and I never really had a logical explanation for it. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. It's, if you start, right, okay, I've got 50 reps and you start yeah, going 50, yeah. 49, 48, 47. For some reason, you, you your, your mind sees it very differently. Well, I think when you're going up the reps and you think, oh, it's 32, 33, my God, I've still got so many more to go. When you're coming down, it's always a, a, a downward number and therefore it's always getting easier. Yeah, yeah. So there's, there's something for you, if no one else. Yeah. Um, okay, so... Tell me about your view on nutrition now and what's going on from that perspective. Because you're quite good on your food and you like knowing lots of different things. So what works for you right now? Well, first things first, balance is key. I mean, just having a balanced nutrition is, I mean, it's going to be optimal for your recovery. Um, in terms of, well, depends what your goals are. I mean, at the moment, I'm doing a lot of carb cycling, um, leaning out a little bit. Um, I'm not really too huge on supplements. I try and get as much as I can from foods. I think variety okay. is really important. If there's anything I've learned over the past few years, it's to get as much variety in there as possible. Um, I eat about six, seven meals a day. I always have. I like small meals, um, but I also do. I, I am one of those people that thinks it's more optimal to eat regularly throughout the day. Okay. Um, is it because that works for you? Yes, but I also, I mean, in terms of comparing it to something like intermittent fasting, I don't think it's optimal okay. if you are looking to gain mass to recover yeah. optimally. That's just my opinion. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Look, I, I'll tell you what I have found over the years. Everyone's different. Uh -huh. And that's the end of it. Yeah. There is, you know, a lot of people say, yeah, yeah intermittent fasting is great. You get really good results from it. It's great for autophagy. It means you, get, you live longer and we're absolute great for certain people. Mm -hmm. Other people work massively well on ketogenic diets. Other people work well on high carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. And everyone is individual, as, every, as we know. But the trouble is people get kind of pigeonholed into a certain diet protocol. And they say, oh, no, if you want to put size on or you want to put mass on, you have got to have carbohydrates at every meal or you've got to have um, three grams of protein per pound of body weight or whatever it is it just doesn't work like that mm. the only way you can you can effectively find out what works for you is trial error a little bit of intelligence mm. a lot of knowledge and then you find what works mm. um, do you, are you finding carb cycling is working for you okay yeah I really enjoy it because I'm I actually do really well on low carb but I get a lot more out of having obviously carbs post and, and uh, post work. I was going to say pre, but I actually do really well when I'm fasted, fasted training, um, obviously okay. because the adrenaline kicks in and you're actually a hell of a lot stronger on yeah. the adrenaline. And uh, yeah. And when you say fasted, does that mean you haven't you haven't eaten at all? From yeah, before training? If I'm training in the morning, which I often yeah. do like a morning session completely fasted, I'll have maybe some BCAAs and some caffeine and that's okay. that's it. And I will feel great. And people don't realise it. Once you've done it a couple of times, you actually yeah. really surprise yourself. You can train really well and hot and I mean lifting weights and yeah. you know, setting those PBs and everything. It's you get past that when you're actually in the gym. Have you ever tried um, taking some fats along with that caffeine and BCA, yep. BCAA? Yeah. And did you find that made any difference? Um, I don't know, to be honest. Uh, to me, it was – I felt great on either because I used to take right. either um, some organic um, coconut oil yeah. or a scoop of almond butter. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, no, I felt great either way. Yeah. Okay. A lot of people do get that kick out the extra fats and especially the yeah. coconut oil again it's it's 
individual. Mm. Some people will work really well on facts. I mean, for me personally, any writing that I do, any blogs, any articles, any anything that's going to take a lot of cognitive function from me, I do best in the morning. And I do better with a high fat content mm -hmm. breakfast of some description with a mediocre amount of protein and very little carbohydrate or if any carbohydrate. Um, and that will certainly get me through a good two, three hours of able to sit down, write and, and focus better. Mm. I know that if I was to get up and have a bowl of porridge and, and berries or whatever the standard issue prescription mm. is, I'd be asleep in half an hour. And, and not want to do any work and just want to go back and eat some more of it. Yeah. I'm actually a huge fan of the meat and nuts diet. I mean, not right. meat, meat and nuts breakfast. Um, yeah. I, I really love fat and protein based um, okay. breakfast, even up until, say, late afternoon, pre work, something, you know, my meal before my workout might have some carbs. But there are even days where I don't prefer to have the carbs at all until after training so I can buy a carb backload right in the end of the, at the end of the day. Um, I find that works really well. I feel great. My energy is great. So I do really well on the high fat yeah. and the protein throughout the day. This is interesting. I was listening to Kiefer yesterday. Mm. Um, he's now going to be doing the rounds very soon because he's got his new carb backloading book coming oh, out. Oh, really? So he's going to want to promote it as much as possible. And I was listening to him yesterday and he was talking about it's not so much now about carb backloading, but it's also about protein backloading as well. No, oh, because that he made some he made some very in, in, yeah he made some interesting comments. So basically, he was saying, and and I'm and I'll share it with you because I know you you'll find it interesting, and hopefully some of the listeners will get something out of it. But he was saying, beginning of the day or the first part of the day is all fats, moderate amount of protein, obviously low carbohydrate, um, and then pre workout. Basically, no carbs, obviously. Keep the fats pretty high. During the workout, no intra nutrition ah. because you'll then still be using the fats and whatever else you've got in your blood to fuel you, things. Yeah. But this is where I got it was quite interesting. He then said, post workout, you don't have anything for at least an hour. Mm -hmm. So. No branched chain amino acids, no protein shake, nothing at all. And his reasoning behind it was, although you're creating a catabolic environment during your training and you're getting a high cortisol response, mm -hmm. that's massively important for growth yep. later on. So you're setting up uh, an environment which is priming um, and setting off processes for growth later. Mm. You don't really want to disturb it by throwing in a shake with carbohydrate and protein in it and blunting that response. So just leave it for about an hour and then just have a meal. And that meal can have a huge amount of carbohydrate in it if it's something that you're doing. If you're hard backloading, for example, and you, and you want to get in an amount of carbohydrate during the day, then that's where to start having it. And yeah, you can have it in a, in a very absorbable form like branch cyclic dextrin or vitargo or something like that, or you can just have it in your potatoes and your... And your uh, um, protein source but then he's saying you can put the majority of your protein later on as well mm. so you're almost during the, the first part of the day having a, a lower um, protein and, and carbohydrate run up to your training but a high fat content mm -hmm. and then post you'd go lean meats or lean white fish um, so that the, the fat content is a lot lower because you've already had that during yeah. the day and you'd focus more on your carbohydrate and your um, and your veg and your lean sources of protein, which I thought was quite interesting, because you know so much is spoken about nutrient timing, that anabolic window. As soon as you finish, put the weight down. You've got to get a shake in you, and so on and so forth. Um, and obviously, everyone's different, but it was an interesting uh, it was an interesting theory. So for the last couple of days, I've been trying it, and um, do you know what? It's actually quite nice not to have to throw a shake down you as soon as you finish and actually calm down a little bit first and then sit down and have a proper meal. Do you know what's really funny? It, it takes me through my phases of the past two and a half years. I remember, you know, when you first start going to the gym and training properly and you have this novelty of, oh, 
shakes and post workout and this and that yeah. and the other. And the more I took a really deep interest in it and wanted to research and I wanted to to find uh, blogs and articles and you know read case studies and try and do my own research and read textbooks and find all the different theories and I remember for the first sort of maybe month or two I had the whole anabolic window thing where I was drinking my shake straight after my workout yeah. then I learned soon learned that it was, uh, it was a complete well in my opinion I think it's complete nonsense you don't need to hurry this and that as long as you're eating you know on a regular basis throughout the day you're not going to be yeah. going catabolic and losing your gains so then that takes me over to the past few months where I've been sort of experimenting a little bit more and I've actually a few weeks ago up until I started doing the intra workout I never used to do intra workout at all I just thought no point in it um, and I was for the past sort of two months before the, the intro, yeah. I was doing exactly what you just described there, and I was pr um, delaying my post-workout meal for an hour and a half. I was doing 90 minutes. <laughs> okay. I used to sit there and think, because I was trying to lean down as well, and I was car backloading, so I was following Kiefer's car backloading, yeah. but I was also delaying it after my workout and I found that it was really nice it was really good I got great results I didn't know why in particular yeah. I just thought well I'll just delay it because it's gonna give me that extra um, post-workout burn after burn and everything or whatever and um, that's an interesting theory but now obviously I've been doing over the past few weeks I've been implementing the intra workout so that's that's um, I'm quite curious okay well so then on that subject, this is this is where you want to look. To go carb backload, protein backload, and leave it for an hour or so, that's going to be optimum for hypertrophy gains. Mm. If you're cool. looking for if you're looking for performance gains, mm. then potentially intra workout yeah. would be wanted or um, soon after you finish you'd want some sort of fast releasing carbohydrate in you simply so that you can recover from that because you're looking for a performance related goal mm. so if you're saying right i want to put it this way if someone comes in and we go back to this five by five and wants to get strong mm. there's a very good case of one the the workout itself is going to be a lot longer mm. to yeah. potentially two maybe two and a half three hours mm. some of these strength guys are in because it takes such long breaks in between Heavy, heavy sets. I, rem I remember the days I was taking two. I was spending two hours, three hours in the gym. <laughs> yeah. So when you're doing that and you're looking for performance in that in that gym, you want to go heavy. You want to get your CNS moving really well. You will need some sort, or you will benefit from some sort of intra carbohydrate intake and a little bit of protein, probably. So about an hour, forty five minutes to an hour into your workout that's a kind of optimum time to start putting in a bit more carbohydrate, the type that you do not have to digest. Mm. Branch cyclic dextrin, yep. isolate from the proteins perspective, or um, Pepto Pro to hydrolyzed casein, they're, they're good to put in. But if you're looking for hypertrophy aesthetic gains, then it's probably not the way to go. And a lot of people will get this confused and go, no, 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 they say I've got to have a shake during mm -hmm. and therefore, mm -hmm. they forget the goal. Yeah, yeah. And and that can be a significant difference. So you could turn around and go, well, I was doing it for 90 minutes and I looked great, felt amazing, really enjoyed that that whole way it worked into my life. I didn't have to rush a shake down me and I, and I, hadn't, I wasn't panicking to get home because I had to eat uh, and my biceps would fall off or whatever it is. <laughs> so it worked really well for you and you got the goals you're after. Now that you put an intra um, in, um that's going to help with a performance-related goal. Mm. So looking at periodization, I'm just, just thinking about your particular situation. From a periodization point of view, you've got until April for your for your show. Yeah. So yeah. You, it might be a really good time now for the next three or four, six weeks to look at intra-workout nutrition to hit some performance yeah. goals and get yeah. some, some yeah. mass on and then save the, the backloading yeah. for post that that periodization and, and like kind of January time start looking at bringing it back down again yeah so probably that's definitely the best way to go I think because at the moment I'm finding it's 
it's really benefited my training. And I never used to, I used to be a little bit skeptical because I, I just thought, well, I don't want those extra empty calories it's not going to make such a huge difference to my workout I don't want carbs in my workout because they'll make me tired and I really yeah. wasn't I didn't think I think a lot I used to expect a lot of it to be that placebo effect you know because people feel like it's their sort of comfort blanket to have something yeah. to, to fuel their energy and I used to think no no I'm perfectly fine on water but over the past few weeks I was pleasantly surprised and I think it's it, it is probably because I'm trying to take my training to the next level and especially trying to balance strength with volume I mean that's a yeah. hell of a lot of uh, stuff going on there yeah so, and, and what you're using you're using uh, genetics workout food yeah workout food at the moment yeah and how are you finding that really good really good yeah. I, I remember before that I was having the targo and uh, I remember a couple of a couple of sessions where I was training legs I felt sick and I thought I, I, why am I feeling sick? And I, I just felt like my stomach was so bloated, and I realised yeah. it's this thing I'm chugging down. That's it, and 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 that's really important. You need to find something that does not need to be digested. You don't want to be digesting anything whilst you're training. It's, exactly. it's horrible. Yeah. So the thing with branched cyclic dextrin, which I know is in that workout food, is it absorbs very very quickly. Mm. Okay, so I'm I'm conscious of time. I don't want to keep you keep you too late. Um, what's the goals going forward now? We've got the UK BFF coming up. What's your next sort of project in your mind? What do you want to know more about? What's your, you know, what's going on in your mind about? I want to know more about this particular thing in nutrition or in in fitness, so, so that that gets you to your next level. What's your thing? Well, over the next few months, I'm going to be going to a few seminars. Um, there's the Physique Elite coming up uh, this month, actually, in the next uh, yeah. next couple of weeks. Um, to be honest, everything's a little bit up in the air at the moment because I'm not sure exactly where I want to. I definitely want to be a coach at some point, so I'm doing a lot of research um, in on the training side of things as well as the, as the nutrition. Whether it's going to be nutrition, dietitian, coach, I'm going to try and take it somewhere towards that avenue. Okay. Um, we'll probably... And which which courses have we been looking at at the moment? Um, in terms of courses, I haven't <laughs> I've okay. been looking. Well, I've been sort of reading a few different suggestions and, and the different um, companies, I, the YMCA or something was suggested to me. I, to be honest, I don't know too much right. about what's on offer, so I'm going to have to do my research into that. But nutrition-wise, I think that's probably been taking my um, um, interest a little bit more. But in terms of just keeping up with you know, reading everything, reading all the different articles and keeping up to date with as much information as I possibly can. I mean, even though the more you read, the more you realize how little you know. Absolutely. It's frightening. It really is. <laughs> um, <laughs> you spend years thinking, actually, I'm, I'm quite good at this. I know my stuff and, you know, I can hold a pretty good conversation with people on a pretty high level. And then someone comes along and just makes you feel like you're, you're, you're in nursery school. I know. Well, the issue think, is... I <laughs> I personally, I just have, I want to do everything. I want to always do too many things. And yeah. that's my problem is I can't just, I'm so indecisive, really, really bad at deciding exactly which avenue I want to take and which course I might want to do if I want to go into education, whether or not I want to do this. And yeah. I don't know, it will, it will just see. But at the moment, the most important thing for me is that I'm just enjoying doing all the research, I'll be sitting there, mm. just, people think it's boring, I enjoy to read textbooks, um, I enjoy reading blogs and following certain PhDs, yeah, that's good. you know. <laughs> so this will be interest. this will be interest to you then, Christina, We've, I've got um, uh, at least two research doctors mm. coming mm. on the podcast in the next few weeks, um, and these are the people that do the research publish the papers mm. that we all then go and try and read and then try and interpret. Uh -huh. So um, one of them's just done her doctorate on nutrient timing and what's the best way to start the day, what's that first meal, what it should it consist of so that your health is optimum. Mm -hmm. um, and the other's an ultra-endurance competitor who has done years and years and years of um, research on why things happen, how to make it better, how to get ultimate performance and so on. Mm. So 
Um, they're going to be coming up in the next few weeks. Fantastic. Um, Fantastic. But definitely, definitely worth a listen to. Um, and yeah, we've got some other good guys coming on as well. Raj Bachu, who I don't know if you've listened to any of uh, um, Ben Coomber's stuff. Oh, yes, yes, Ra- of course. Raj has been on there, and he's, he's a very, very intelligent, clever guy. Mm-hmm. Um, very good friend of mine I see him a lot I do a lot of work with him but some of the things that he talks about even I just sit there and go oh I can't even begin to understand how you've retained all this information so there's some really really um, exciting stuff coming up Um, so I want to say thank you for today you've been amazing thank you it's been a pleasure really really great to hear your journey what you've done again really really grateful that you've been so honest and open so I appreciate that of course always I'm sure a lot of people can relate, and it's just one of those things that I think it's important to be able to talk, to talk, and to yeah. share, and to learn. I mean, learning, education. Definitely. Absolutely. So for people who want to find out more about you, where can they go? Where can they find you? Well, uh, <laughs> if you go to kvmedia.co.uk, you get all my social media links from there. That's, that's my photography um, company page. So if you go on there, you'll be able to link to me. I'm on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, of course, and LinkedIn. Okay. So. And I want to put all those links in the show notes so people can click on there and, and find out where you are. And in the meanwhile, again, thank you so much. Thank you. And I look forward to seeing you down the gym next time. Yeah, definitely. You too. See you soon. Right. See you soon. Take care, Paul. Take care. Bye. Bye.